Wednesday, in federal court, Judge Stephen McGlynn will be meeting with plaintiffs, attorneys to discuss the trajectory of the case and uh, some interesting things being brought up in a roadmap that McGlynn's offering up to deal with these specific issues. The weaponry in question is an item an ordinary person would keep at home for the purpose of self-defense. The weaponry in question is not exclusively or predominantly useful in military service, and the weaponry in question is not possessed for unlawful purposes. Those are just some of the questions that Judge Stephen McGlynn says need to be addressed in the case challenging Illinois' gun and magazine ban. Welcome back. Bishop on air. I'm here with you. Each and every weekday morning, we've been tracking the litigation against Illinois' gun and magazine ban since the ban was put into place January of 2023 and all of the myriad lawsuits that came out uh so you have of course uh you know the the northern district of illinois with the beavis case uh in naperville and uh, you had one outcome up there on preliminary grounds going the way of the state but then you had in the southern district uh four plaintiffs groups where the judge stephen mcglynn there he did indeed uh say that uh there's a likelihood that plaintiffs are going to win on the case uh, so you had McGlynn issue that preliminary injunction and six days of an injunction against the state from enforcing the law until the state went to the Seventh Circuit and asked for a stay, essentially not letting McGlynn's injunction go into place. So then, obviously, uh, you had this continued back and forth uh, going all the way up to the U.S. Supreme Court even, but a full record wasn't made. So now it's back to the district court where Judge McGlynn is moving forward in an expedited fashion. And we've got a status hearing uh, on the 28th. That's Wednesday. I still got to double check to see if that's going to be an open court or if I'm going to be able to tune in via phone or if it's a, a closed court scheduling conference with the plaintiff's attorneys. Uh, but we've been tracking this all the way up to this point, and on Friday, Judge Stephen McGlynn, he issued an order in that Southern District case. So let's go ahead and take a look at this together uh, as we review the 16 pages that Judge Stephen McGlynn uh, issued in this in this order. Uh, so we'll just kind of uh, read through this, uh, and, and, and you can follow along. Uh, in order to address potential confusion, the court issues the following order to clearly lay out the path forward in this litigation and advancing the scheduling conference on Wednesday, the 28th. The court first notes that the parties may offer any relevant evidence and advance any arguments as to any relevant issue in litigation. Uh, the, the judge then goes on to talk about uh, the case is a constitutional challenge against the Protect Illinois Communities Act. The plaintiffs in this action argue that PICA is unconstitutional under the 2nd, 5th, and 14th Amendment. The focus of this order will be the Second Amendment claims. The Supreme Court has provided guidance on how Second Amendment cases should be analyzed via a one-step historical test. All right. The Seventh Circuit has stated that their pre-existing test from Friedman v. Circuit uh, City of Highland Park is uh, consonant with Bruin's historical test because it was not explicitly abrogated by Bruin. So the Seventh Circuit, uh, Judge McGlynn saying, is uh, looking at things that they say that the Bruin court did not reverse. So uh, McGlynn continues on here. He says that Bruin ruled the government must affirmatively prove that its firearm regulation is part of the historical tradition that delimits the outer bounds of the right to keep and bear arms. Moreover, two of the relevant metrics are how and why regulated uh, regulations burden a law-abiding citizen's right to armed self-defense. The Supreme Court emphasized in Bruin that Heller previously determined that the Second Amendment protects only the carrying of weapons that are those in common use at the time, as opposed to those that are highly unusual in society at large. Importantly, when considering weapons that were banned at the time of the founding, quote, uh, even these uh, colonial laws prohibited the carrying of handguns because they were considered dangerous and unusual weapons in the 1690s. They provide no justification for laws restricting the public carry of weapons that are unquestionably in common use today. The Second Amendment does not preclude restrictions or the outright prohibition of weapons that are dangerous and unusual, in quotes. Therefore, the Second Amendment protects weapons that are in common use, as long as they are not dangerous and unusual. Put another way, McGlynn wrote, weapons that fit into common use category 
and not into the dangerous and unusual category, cannot be proscribed by the federal or state governments. Proscribed means to regulate, to limit, to ban. Additionally, the Supreme Court stated that the definition of bear uh, naturally encompasses public carry because most gun owners do not wear a holstered pistol at their hip in the bedroom or while sitting at the dinner table. Although individuals often keep firearms in their home at the ready for self-defense, most do not bear, i.e. carry, them in the home beyond moments of actual confrontation. To confine the right to bear arms to the home would nullify half of the Second Amendment's operative protections. As the need for armed self-defense is perhaps most acute in the home, we did not suggest that the need was insufficient elsewhere because many Americans hazard great danger outside the home more so than in it. He wrote, uh, the Seventh Circuit contends that freedmen, and again, this is the Seventh Circuit. Uh, he's he's reviewing what they had to say in the in the case uh, Freedman versus uh, you know and Beavis versus Naperville do not suffer from Bruin's instruction that any two step test is one step too many. The circuit adopts a scheme in which, prior to conducting the any Second Amendment analysis as to a weapon, attachment, or magazine, the court must first determine if the item in question constitutes an arm for the purpose of Second Amendment. See Beavis. Uh, if the item does not, then the Seventh Circuit holds that the Second Amendment has nothing to say about a law banning and restricting it. This method is required even if the item otherwise falls within the definition of what constitutes an arm, as set out in Heller and Bruin. The Seventh Circuit contends that this pre-certification process renders freedmen consistent with the methodology approved in Bruin that they employed in Beavis. This court is tasked with determining whether the plaintiffs are entitled to declaratory and equitable relief they seek, specifically that Illinois be enjoined from enforcing the provisions of PICA due to their unconstitutionality. In Friedman and Beavis, the Seventh Circuit has come at the question from a different direction than that was utilized by the Supreme Court in Bruin. As will be more fully explained herein, the plaintiffs should proceed in their constitutional challenge to PICA, offering evidence relevant to the tests of Heller and Bruin, as well as the tests applied in Beavis. The court is mindful that the Friedman Beavis test manifestly shifts which party bears the burden to prove which arms are outside protection of reach of the Second Amendment. Beavis requires the citizen to prove that the weapon in question are protected by the Second Amendment instead of placing the burden on the government to prove that its law banning or restricting arms is consistent with the historical tradition that delimits the outer bounds of the right to keep and bear arms. In its treatment of the banned AR-15, and any of its cousins covered in the act, the Beavis court opined that it was likely they could be banned because based on the record before us, we are not persuaded that the AR-15 is materially different than the M16. Goes on to quote, Heller informs us that the uh, latter weapon is not protected by the Second Amendment and therefore may be regulated or banned because it's indistinguishable from the machine gun. The AR-15 may be treated in the same manner without offending the Second Amendment, McGlynn writes, quoting Beavis. The Seventh Circuit concluded this portion of the opinion by stressing again that this is just a preliminary look at the subject, and the Second Amendment's challenge to gun regulations often require more evidence than is presented in the early phase of litigation. McGlynn quotes, uh, Because of this, the Seventh Circuit stated that there thus will be more to come. And we do not rule out the possibility that plaintiffs will find other evidence that shows a sharper distinction between AR-15s and M-16s and each one of its relatives than the present record reveals. Moreover, better data on firing rates might change the analysis of whether the AR-15 and comparable weapons fall into military or civilian side of the line. So the burdens of proof, uh, are the arms covered by the Second Amendment. Considering the discussion above, McGlynn writes, plaintiffs must establish that the items in question are not items that are beyond the gravitational pull of the Second Amendment. In other words, that the items are not on the wrong side of the delimits of the Second Amendment. According to the Seventh Circuit, Second Amendment protections does not embrace weapons that are exclusively or predominantly used in military service 
or weapons that are not possessed for lawful purposes. Such items would not trigger Second Amendment protections, even though they would otherwise clearly fit in the definition of arms as defined in Heller and reaffirmed in Bruin. So Beavis requires the plaintiffs to establish by a preponderance of the evidence that one, the weaponry in question is an item an ordinary person would keep at home for possess for purpose of self-defense. The weaponry in question is not exclusively or predominantly used in military service. And the weaponry in question is not possessed for unlawful purposes. And there's a footnote there, the first footnote in six pages. And you scroll down and it says the example given is the uh, idea of a sawed off shotgun. Um, with this in mind, it appears the, the prong applies only to a class of arms or attachments and is not a component of the bearer's case specific criminal intent. All right, so that's the footnote. Uh, but he goes on to say, if the plaintiffs can prove uh, that the above three proportion uh, pro propositions, rather, uh, then the item is captured by the gravitational pull of the Second Amendment and the case ripens at the moment into a claim where the Second Amendment might have something to say about it, according to the Seventh Circuit's rationale in Friedman and Beavis. Having been captured within the Second Amendment's gravitational pool in order to land safely on terra firma, the plaintiffs need only establish by the preponderance of the evidence that arms, attachments, and or magazines are in common use for any lawful purpose and are not otherwise dangerous and unusual. If they are able to establish all of the above, the plaintiffs will have met their burden to prove that the ban on specific items in PICA violates their Second Amendment rights. Friedman and Beavis do hold that fully automatic machine guns are categorically beyond the limits of the Second Amendment protection. They write, reaffirm the rule of the Second Amendment does not authorize private persons to possess weapons such as machine guns and sawed off shotguns that the governments would not expect or allow citizens to bring with them when the militia is called to service. That being said, the Seventh Circuit also acknowledges that obviously many weapons are dual use. Private parties have a constitutionally protected right to keep and bear them, and military provides them to its forces. In this sense, there is a thumb on the scale in favor of the Second Amendment protection. This exceptionally important clarification res resolves any confusion that an arm can never enter the gravitational pull of the Second Amendment simply by virtue of the fact that the military may provide the arm or a similar arm to its forces or they would be useful in military and law enforcement setting. Clearly, the dual purpose rule does not require arms, attachments, or magazines to be defined as either for an exclusively military purpose or for an exclusively civilian purpose. Just because an arm has a cousin in the military does not mean that the arm is beyond Second Amendment protection. The Seventh Circuit acknowledges acknowledgement of the dual purpose of a weapon could fairly be restated as follows. A civilian can have constitutionally protected right to keep and bear particular arms, attachments, or magazines, even if the military provides the same or similar arms, attachments, or magazines to its own forces, or law enforcement provides them to the officers in the arms uh, if the arms have a dual use. Uh, critically, the Seventh Circuit places the thumb on the scale in favor of Second Amendment protections for dual-use arms. It in, in acknowledging the obvious, as the, sec, the Circuit words it, the task at hand comes into clearer focus. It also helps chart the path for discovery in this case and more clearly fleshes out how a hearing on the merits should look. In this vein, the plaintiffs may choose to provide evidence that semi-automatic rifles, carbines, and pistol handguns uh, spe specified attachments, barrel shrouds, uh, foregrips, flash suppressors, etc., and or magazines holding a specific number of rounds and or ammunition carrying devices are commonly held by civilians for self-defense or other lawful purposes and are not exclusively or predominantly useful in military or lawful enforce uh, law enforcement context. Even if they are used by the military or by law enforcement, dual use may still be demonstrated. Once dual use is established, the scale tips towards Second Amendment protections. A. How weapons are sorted between military and civilian use. It's important to understand, McGlynn writes, that there are far more similarities than dissimilarities between military use and civilian use when it comes to specific semi-automatic fire uh, rifles and pistols. Thus. The sorting process must necessarily be more probing and multifaceted and must consider why a citizen might select certain weapons for self-defense 
and the practical challenges citizens face when called upon to defend their lives. McGlynn continues, uh, military use. The M16 and M4 are designed to be carried by members of the military. Military members utilizing M16 rifles or M4 carbines do so in specific ways from guarding critical facilities or equipment to advancing on specific targets. Such soldier, soldiers, Marines, airmen, and sailors are deployed with various other pieces of equipment, including but not limited to Kevlar, body armor, utility uniforms, tactical boots, load-bearing vests, knives, flashlights, a radio, sidearm, copious quantities of spare ammunition, to list a few. Our troops also proceed into harm's way as a trained unit, supported by air cover, reinforcements, medical support, naval support, and recognizance, and intelligence from human and satellite sources. In such situations, the M16 and M4 are designed to fulfill a specific niche. Their semi-automatic fire feature permits precise targeting shooting while their ability to fire in three round bursts or in full auto capacity is designed to provide suppression fire in a situation where members of a squad are moving to or from an objective. Military hardware must meet the exact military specifications to fire in fully automatic capacity for a substantial period of time without failure. Civilian use. The average civilian may be called upon to defend his or her person, family, or property from an armed attack or invasion. This person is usually ambushed or is the target of a sneak attack and is struck with is stuck with the weapons he or she has readily available. The civilian may be called upon to defend others who are not armed and often will not have time to plan or regroup with other allied defenders. Combat in the home or property may draw the civilian away from ammunition supplies. The storage of arms in the household usually requires restricted access to firearms and munitions because they must be maintained under lock and key and inaccessible to children or those who might self-harm. In an emergent situation, the accuracy, safety, ease of use, and magazine capacity of an individual defense weapon may literally be the difference between life and death of the civilian and his or her family members. Thus, while both members of the military and civilians may be called upon to engage mortal combat, the civilian is often an army of one with no backup, no support, no reinforcements in the moments when the attack occurs. The life and death stakes mandates that their firearms have both lethal capabilities and give, at minimum, our citizens a fighting chance. Therefore, sorting between military use and civilian use is an exercise in understanding the complex dynamics of self-defense in which lethal force may be required to repel a rapist, a murderer, an arsonist, a kidnapper, a stalker, an armed burglar, or multiple attackers at once. Moreover, if our inquiry is fully satisfied by simply considering a self-defense scenario in which one physically fit person confronts one other person at his or her front door while armed with a pistol or a pump action shotgun, then this case is fairly straightforward. However, if we consider only that scenario, then our search is superficial and woefully inadequate. Considering only that scenario does a great disservice to citizens who face mortal combat under very different circumstances. Unlike members of the military who must meet rigorous physical standards, in order to be deployed in combat, citizens who may find themselves in a self-defense scenario may be of various ages with various ranges of physical mobility. Unlike deployed members of the military, a civilian called to defend himself or others may not be able to operate a pump action shotgun or a pistol by reason of disability, age, or infirmity. Therefore, such considerations of physically fit individuals only would impermissibly exclude the elderly, disabled, infirmed, and others. It would also ignore the myriad challenges facing a citizen in defending himself or herself in a confrontation. Characteristics uh, and considerations. The following non-exhaustive list of considerations may be relevant to whether or not an item has lawful purposes or falls within dual category, all right, the dual use category. So again, this is uh, all from Judge Stephen McGlynn on Friday issuing this order. It's 16 pages long. We've read through most of it here, but now he's going to start going through uh, things to consider and considerations. And I want you to just kind of answer these questions yourself as you're watching, uh, you know, yes or no type of questions here as you're watching these uh, these go through uh, so characteristics and considerations the following non exist exhaustive list of considerations may be relevant to whether or not an item has lawful purpose or falls within the dual use category does the item in question expand the civilians options for offensive and, or defensive strategy and or tactics for the protection of an individual or others in confronting one or more armed assailants improve accuracy uh, safety conform 
uh, comforts or ease of operation, protect against hearing damage, flash blindness or personal injury, reduce recoil, reduce or eliminate downtime because of reloading, cycling or uh, lack of ammunition before the threat's neutralized or accommodates a disability. Uh, handicap or physical infirmity. Uh, regarding magazines and ammunition feeding devices, either party can offer evidence that magazines with a capacity of more than 10 rounds for rifles or more than 15 rounds for pistols are reserved for military use. However, if the plaintiff establishes that magazines or of larger capacity for rifles and pistols are in common use and are dual purposed, then the plaintiffs satisfy uh, both Beavis and Bruin, and the courts may treat such magazines as protected dual-use arms covered by the Second Amendment. Historical tradition. If the plaintiffs established the weapons, attachments, or ammunition feeding devices proscribed, again, banned by PICA, are arms included within the protected reach of the Second Amendment in line with Freedmen uh, and Beavis, the governments must affirmatively prove that PICA is part of the historical tradition that delimits uh, the outer bound of the rights to keep and bear arms via a showing of how and why the regulations burden a law-abiding citizen's right to arm self-defense. The court notes that such raw data has already been provided in other Second Amendment challenges across the United States. So anticipated findings of fact. This uh, again is from Judge Stephen McGlynn, who is um, uh, the, the judge over this case in the Southern District of Illinois federal courts where uh, he's got uh, the case on an expedited basis. Uh, just seeing that uh, we did go down and as far as uh, connected uh, to the internet. So uh, hopefully we can get this back on as we uh, are at least recording this locally. So that's, uh, that's good news. Uh, recording this locally for everybody so that we don't lose uh, any kind of uh, connectivity on the on the recording uh, as we review Judge McGlynn's order here in the Southern District case. Uh, so uh, back to it, uh, you've got uh, anticipated findings of facts. The parties are uh, to meet and confer regarding a discovery schedule and the date for a final hearing on the merits of the plaintiff's claims for declaratory and equitable relief. The court has previously advised the parties that this case will proceed in an expedited basis. The court evaluates issues regarding burdens of proof and the elements and the re respective parties must prove by a preponderance of evidence in order to succeed in their claims of defenses. While the court sets out its analysis, uh, for moving forward, the parties should know that this order will neither prevent any party from advancing any arguments, nor restrict any party from offering any relevant evidence, or advancing other theories of the case which individual parties deem appropriate. When the court does enter a judgment with respect to the claims in this case, the court will make a series of findings on fact based upon the relevant case law. Heller, Bruin, Friedman, and Beavis. However, the parties are free to suggest the court make specific findings on fact on other elements or issues that they believe are relevant to Heller or Bruin. Uh, the court notes the Seventh Circuit and Beavis treated semi-automatic rifles as a category in referring to the AR-15 and its cousins covered by the act. Uh, in light of this, the court will treat evidence relevant to any of the banned firearms as relevant to the class of category of firearms to which the weapon belongs. Additionally, the court will also consider any evidence relevant to a class or categories of firearms to be relevant to any individual firearm in that class or category of firearms. So here's where uh, it's interesting, and I want you to uh, um, kind of go back and forth, and I appreciate everybody uh, chiming in uh, with the, the live stream. It keeps dipping uh, in and out uh, for whatever reason, uh, but we will uh, hopefully get this out to you in uh, it, it, its whole recording, all right? So, uh, again, uh, it says that we keep getting disconnected and reconnected and reconnected and disconnected for whatever reason. Uh, so here we are. Um, here's the list of questions from McGlynn. All right, the factual questions the court will address include, is the item an arm as defined by Heller and Bruin? Is the item an arm as defined by Beavis? Is there a rational basis for a civilian to select a particular arm for use in self-defense of the home? Is there a rational basis for a civilian to select a particular item for use in self-defense outside the home? Is there a rational basis for a civilian to select a particular item for use in self-defense to repel a riot or large-scale attack? This is an interesting one. Number six, is the item an arm that may be used to resist tyranny? That's an interesting question there. Uh, and I'd be uh, fascinated uh, to see how that gets answered by both the plaintiffs and the states. 
Is the item exclusively or predominantly useful in military or law enforcement settings? Is the item specifically designed by the United States military as a weapon to be acquired by the U.S. military and issued to its troops? That's another interesting question. Uh, you've also got the, uh, the judge continuing on. Does the item meet all the specifications required by the United States military to qualify for use as a rifle or pistol to be deployed to the U.S. troops? Is the weapon materially different from an M16, M4, or machine gun? Is the firing rate of semi-automatic weapons banned by PICA materially different from the firing rate of M16, M4, or fully automatic machine guns? Is the item a dual-use arm that may be used in both military and civilian settings? Is the item principally possessed and used for unlawful purposes? Is the item in common use? And is the item dangerous and unusual? Again, just some of these questions the, the judge says he's going to address uh, during this case. And then he also talks about claims for monetary damages and something that will also be considered. So this is uh, the, the order that uh, Judge Stephen McGlynn issued, a long segment here, but I just wanted to go ahead and read through all of that uh, so that you guys had uh, good context as to uh, what's going to happen here as we move forward with this case so obviously you've got uh, the the southern district of illinois they've got a scheduling conference with the plaintiff's attorneys uh, to talk more about uh, the ongoing uh, litigation and how they proceed forward uh, so very much looking forward to uh, seeing how this goes and when exactly we're going to get to say a trial on the merits of all of this uh, so hey uh, bishop on air like subscribe hit that notification bell join me each and every weekday morning as we uh, hang out with you and uh, give you the latest on what's going on with the gun and magazine bans in the state of Illinois. All right. Appreciate it. Like, subscribe, hit that notification bell. Always more to come.